I hope uh, you will enjoy the webinar. I thank uh, the sponsors and the provider MCA for this uh, amazing job in putting together this uh, program and this uh, faculty together with me. And uh, with no further delay, I very pleased. I'm very pleased to leave the floor and uh, and uh, the talk to Professor Nicola Principi from Milan. He will uh, show you which is the updated evidence uh, on pediatric COVID-19. Professor Principi, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, to thank all the organizers, including uh, Paolo, that is one of the best friends of mine. And uh, uh, I am very happy to be here and to discuss with you the problems of pediatric COVID-19. Uh, because uh, I think that uh, children are quite different from adult and old people regarding the COVID-19. They have a lot of differences uh, regarding several points, uh, several uh, problems, uh, including uh, those uh, that uh, I think can be summarized uh, in one of my slides. This one, uh, I think that uh, children uh, are uh, different uh, uh, from adults uh, uh, regarding incidence of infant disease, uh, clinical manifestations, uh, also diagnosis and therapeutic approach, and uh, they have uh, uh, peculiar problems, uh, such uh, as uh, uh, the role uh, of, uh, in the diffusion of uh, virus, uh, the problem of uh, attendance to school, uh, and also use of masks. I will try to summarize uh, which uh, is uh, present knowledge uh, regarding all these problems. Regarding uh, incidence, uh, uh, we can say that uh, since the beginning uh, of the pandem pandemic, uh, it was uh, clearly shown that uh, children uh, have uh, uh, practically a marginal role in the epidemiology of the disease because no more than 2% of all the cases that uh, were uh, seen in China in the first weeks uh, after pandemic declaration were uh, uh, detected in uh, children. And, uh, this uh, very low incidence rate uh, was confirmed uh, in all the countries uh, in uh, which uh, the epidemiological, epidemiological evaluation were made. In the United States, 2%, in Italy, 1.2%, in Spain, 0.2%. And uh, this means that uh, a very few number of children were hospitalized and were admitted to the intensive care uh, unit. This is very uh, important. And uh, when you look uh, at the characteristics uh, of the sign and symptom of disease in children, we can confirm uh, what was the first, uh, uh, the first uh, um, uh, clinical evaluation. In, in other words, uh, that uh, in most of the cases, uh, children had uh, a mild uh, disease uh, and uh, in uh, a great number of cases, uh, children uh, had an asymptomatic disease. If you uh, add uh, the number of cases with my disease, uh, with the number of cases with asymptomatic disease, you can see that more than 50% of all uh, the uh, children uh, have a very marginal clinical problem. This is uh, uh, probably a, a number that is uh, also uh, lower than that uh, really present uh, in the pediatric population because uh, um, most of the cases uh, or a great number of cases uh, were lost just because they have uh, a mild, uh, uh, mild disease. When we compare uh, the uh, sign and symptom of disease of children with those of adults, uh, we can see that uh, from a clinical point of view, the uh, clinical pictures were quite similar. Uh, even if uh, uh, children had uh, a lower incidence of fever, a lower incidence uh, of cough, and uh, this is uh, probably related to the fact that uh, most of the children uh, had a very mild uh, disease. But it is not completely true, because uh, if you look uh, at uh, some cases, some uh, um, surveys, uh, you can see that uh, children can have uh, uh, pneumonia. This is uh, one of the, the surveys that we carried out uh, in uh, China. They can have pneumonia with uh, uh, abnormalities uh, that are quite similar to those that are fine in, uh, in adults. But in these cases, most of the children had no clinical manifestation. They had no fever. They had no 
these uh, this is very very strange. Uh, again, when we look at the severe cases, the few severe cases, you can see that the neonates and infant children are those with the highest risk of severe cases, and this uh, is important for Paolo and for all the neonatologists. Uh, finally, I think that uh, uh, probably a certain number of the pediatric cases. Uh, are uh, quite different from those of adults uh, because they are complicated by clinical manifestations that uh, do not occur in adults. This is one of the examples and regard the, the possible uh, close relationship between uh, uh, COVID-19 and the development of Kawasaki disease. You know that Kawasaki disease uh, is uh, a rare but uh, sometimes severe disease that uh, is uh, usually triggered by an infectious uh, agent and uh, that uh, is characterized by a significant uh, hyperinflammation. And this uh, is what happened in Bergamo, that is one of the Italian town, towns uh, in uh, which uh, the uh, incidence rate of COVID-19 was the highest in Italy. And you can see that in the last period, in the same period in which the uh, pandemic occurred, we had a great number of new cases of Kawasaki disease, uh, particularly those uh, that was the severest I've never seen in Bergamo. And this is one very important relationship because it is peculiar of children and obviously was, not, was never found in adults. But one of the problem is why children have a low incident rate, a low severity of disease. Several hypotheses have been made and I I think that none of them is totally satisfactory. I think that one, some of them are very interesting to discuss. Uh, for example, it is important to highlight the potential role of S2, the antitensine converting enzyme 2, that is the cellular antireceptor for the virus, that uh, is probably um, in uh, lower density in the cells uh, of uh, children. Just uh, today has been published uh, in JAMA, a paper in which uh, it has been demonstrated that, that children uh, have a lower density in the nose in comparison to adults. And uh, consequently, the virus cannot uh, attach the, uh, the cells uh, of the host. Another possible uh, explanation is that the, the soluble H2 uh, is uh, in, in present in a greater, greater amount in children and can be protective as it attracts SARS-CoV-2 before cell attachment. And these uh, um, hypotheses uh, are very interesting. None of them uh, is completely satisfactory, but they are uh, uh, the basis for new studies to understand why children are different from adults. Regarding therapy, uh, you know that a lot of drugs have been selected for possible use in a, a patient with COVID-19. You know that uh, only uh, remdesivir has been authorized for emergency use by FDA. All the other drugs are in study, but are not authorized for official use in patients. For children, only remdesivir has been authorized, obviously with different dosages in comparison with adults. But uh, we uh, do not uh, have uh, in uh, uh, the use of these drugs in children. We do not know uh, uh, how and whether this uh, drug is able to reduce uh, the replication of the virus uh, in uh, children. Uh, an interesting uh, drug could be hydroxychloroquine that uh, in vitro and in vivo studies has been demonstrated to be able to reduce uh, the uh, replication rate uh, of the virus. But you know that uh, when used uh, in uh, uh, adults, uh, in uh, adults with severe disease, uh, the results uh, of the human impacts uh, are conflicting. We don't know whether or not it is uh, able to, uh, uh, is effective in uh, adults. But uh, uh, I think that if, uh, if this drug is uh, useful, probably it can be useful uh, mainly as a prophylaxis, as uh, usually 
of course, uh, in malaria. But uh, also in this case, a lot of studies uh, are ongoing. Uh, this, uh, here the list of uh, children that could be treated with Verandesivir. But you know that uh, uh, practically only children with uh, a severe underlying disease are candidates for uh, treatment. Uh, healthy children with, uh, with the severe disease are not in the list. Uh, a problem that is not solved is the role of children in the COVID infusion. Uh, you know that uh, most uh, the children have MI disease who are asymptomatic, but uh, uh, it has been demonstrated that they can uh, diffuse the children because asymptomatic uh, patients uh, have been found able to uh, diffuse the, the uh, virus and cause uh, the cases uh, in uh, other uh, households. But uh, it is difficult to establish what is the role of children because we do not know how many children are infected. As I have already told you, uh, most of the children probably were not identified uh, due to their mild uh, disease. We, we do not know what, what is uh, the amount of virus that they are able to uh, shed and uh, if uh, the amount is high enough to transmit the infection. And, and uh, consequently, we do not uh, know if, if we have a real uh, important role in uh, the diffusion. It is a problem that uh, must be studied because many of the decisions regarding children are based to the idea that, that uh, are able to diffuse the infection. Consequently, this is a point that must be solved. Uh, one of the problems that uh, um, has been uh, discussed and then we solved it in a way that uh, I am not convinced that it is the best uh, solution is uh, regarded as school closure. School closure was decided by most uh, of uh, the health uh, authorities uh, uh, worldwide, taking in account uh, that uh, school closure was effective in reducing uh, virus circulation and disease incidence when uh, influenza was considered. And, uh, uh, the school closure, uh, when uh, uh, influenza uh, the season uh, is characterized by a great number of severe cases. For during the uh, influenza pandemic, it was effective. But this uh, is probably related to the difference uh, in the virus uh, circulation and virus uh, characteristics to compare to uh, task or two. Uh, you know that uh, in, uh, this is valid only, only when uh, the infecting virus and local visibility and attack rates are higher. This is valid for influenza, but not for uh, task or two. And this probably explains uh, why there are doubts uh, on the real uh, efficacy of school closure on virus uh, diffusion. Uh, another uh, problem that uh, uh, is uh, not solved and uh, is uh, important is the use of masks in uh, children. You know that we have two types of masks. The surgical masks could be used uh, uh, in uh, the children, but uh, we have uh, some uh, problems because uh, the size of the mask frequently does not apply to the face uh, of children because children are uh, subject uh, that uh, uh, are uh, in some way difficult uh, for wearing uh, the, uh, the mask. They in, uh, there are uh, several uh, conditions in which children cannot wear the mask, they tend to uh, touch the face continuously, they can uh, be the cause of diffusion of the, the virus from, uh, from uh, the other uh, surfaces uh, that are contaminated from their face just because they touch continuously the mask. And if you look, look at the, the suggestion of CBC, uh, they practically uh, uh, say that uh, practically younger children uh, 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 must not uh, wear the mask because the, young, the youngest uh, can uh, be suffocated by the mask and uh, the children in uh, uh, preschool age can uh, uh, transmit the infection instead of protect itself uh, from the infection. This is a very difficult problem to uh, solve and uh, this uh, um, practically explains uh, why uh, in, uh, it is uh, easier to decide uh, which, uh, which are the situations in which children uh, should not wear the mask 
a situation in which they have to wear the mask. This is the recommendation of uh, the uh, US CDC. And I think that it is a problem that is uh, not uh, completely solved and uh, remain uh, a problem for uh, the native population that uh, has been protected uh, uh, from uh, the COVID. I, uh, I finish, uh, I remain, uh, I stay uh, available for uh, questions. Thank you very much. A really great presentation and you gave us a, a, a very complete overview of uh, the state of the art regarding COVID-19 in pediatric patients. So there's a, there are already a number of questions uh, and obviously placed uh, around your presentation, but I will keep these questions for the end of the three talks. We will have a discussion time at the end of uh, the program. Uh, so keep on, uh, all the audience, keep on uh, taping questions and uh, I will uh, pick up uh, some of them uh, at the end of the talks. So now it's, uh, it's my turn and uh, I will uh, show you uh, which is the evidence so far and uh, the related epidemiology about the neonatal COVID-19, something that uh, it's... Uh, supposed to be less impacting than pediatric COVID-19 and even more less impacting than adult COVID-19. Next, please. Next again. So uh, this is uh, the overview of my talk. I will uh, take uh, in the first module uh, a number of issues regarding neonatal uh, and uh, infant immunology and immunity mainly because these uh, few uh, issues that I will discuss with you are the solid background to understand which can be our strategies in order to tackle COVID in neonates. In the second module, I will show you which is the updated evidence and epidemiology regarding neonatal COVID-19 with some uh, report of uh, different, coming from different countries and uh, some scientific recommendations issued by different national and international societies. Next. Next, please. Okay, um, you can uh, go next again. Uh, this uh, slide summarizes uh, the natural flow of immunity in infants in the first couple of years. Uh, and I underlined with these two bubbles, which is the window of vulnerability in infants. And the window of vulnerability is though that period preceding vaccination and somewhat being, um, being covered by immunity coming passively from the mother, either through placental transfer or through breastfeeding. Please, next. In summary, in the first three months, the baby is fully dependent from availability of maternal antibodies that can pass through placenta in a natural or enhanced way through maternal vaccination in pregnancy. Also, breastfeeding provides this consistent number of antibodies. And as a whole, these first two, three months are actually those at higher risk, as every pediatrician know, for acquiring infections in the first epochs of life. And COVID-19 makes no exception, as we will see. After three months, the initial responses to vaccines together with the continuing breastfeeding makes the infant uh, little by little more able to defend, more competent to develop and to mount an immune response towards several pathogens that he encounters during his life. Next, please. Next one. Okay, so you know that uh, the critical first months uh, may be managed only thanks uh, to maternal antibodies. But how can we 
ensure this uh, transfer. Next, please. Prematurity interrupts the optimal transfer because uh, as you know, and as you see very nicely from this uh, very old but still valid paper, even three or four weeks in anticipation of birth may count very much in terms of availability of antibodies. Late preterms, that is babies born around 35 or 36 weeks of gestational age, may have half of the antibodies taken from the mothers, even less if the baby is born beyond, below 32 weeks of gestational age. The number of antibodies is uh, one-fourth or even one-fifth of those who would be needed to give protection. Next, please. Next. Please, the next one. Can you proceed, please? Next one. No, there's uh, sir, we are going ahead. We are. Uh, I think you you cannot no, I, see the slide. I and now see. I'm module two. Okay, so uh, now I I see. Sorry. Okay. Uh, in module two. Uh, let's uh, skip back, sorry, for uh, this other, the previous slide. Yes. Sorry for that. There are some line issues. So in summary, um, we need to receive maternal antibodies and we need to receive them when only with a term delivery. We also know that uh, the duration of uh, activity of maternal antibodies is around 17 weeks. So we need to cover this period and we need to make safe the baby in this period because this is uh, the, exactly the period in which uh, most of uh, ad admissions due to respiratory viruses occurs. And as you see in this slide, when a serum concentration of specific anti-RSV antibodies, as an example, are lower than needed, it's statistically significantly higher the odds to be admitted for a severe infection by this virus. In contrast, the babies who have inherited high levels of antibodies are not admitted. Next, please. Next one. Okay, so in module two, we'll uh, tackle the um, issues regarding COVID-19 in neonates and what happens with pregnant women delivery and a, 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 little, uh, a little focus on which are the good practices in the NICU. Next one, please. So is it a problem, COVID-19, also in infants and neonates? the limited burden and the limited severity makes us think that actually the burden of COVID-19 is very low and this is not a problem. But however, there are cases series that even though with limited number of neonates uh, raise concerns because uh, we might not be able to capture all the cases that occur. Please, next slide. In, uh, is it a problem, COVID-19 in pregnancy or at delivery? We at the moment do not know if COVID-19 would cause problems during pregnancy or if COVID would affect the health of a baby during uh, after birth. COVID-19 can be passed from a pregnant woman to the fetus of newborn, but the, uh, the answer is no. We don't have any confirmed neonatal vertical transmission so far. So if this is a concern, we are close currently to exclude this uh, uh, fear. Also another fear, another concern that we are not able to rule out 
at the moment if the weather COVID-19 may hurt the baby during pregnancy. Teratogenicity of COVID-19 may not yet be ruled out because uh, the natural history of the infection is uh, still too young to allow us make uh, presumptions or having uh, data. But as a matter of fact, this is something that we'll need to monitor carefully during the next months when we will see being born those babies having been generated during the COVID epidemic. However, if we take a look to all the respiratory viruses that circulate during epidemic season uh, of any family, it's a re it would be really unlikely for a coronavirus to have a teratogenic uh, potential. Next, please. The prevalence of COVID-19 in pregnant women at delivery could be higher than we presume. Uh, a very nice uh, epidemiologic study in New York has been performed during two consecutive weeks in late March, early April. And this study showed very clearly that a lot of women admitted for delivery are actually COVID positive despite having no symptoms and no suspicion to be positive. The figures are there, and as you see, the risk of underestimating COVID-19 positivity in women delivering is very high. And this place also uh, neonatal uh, units, nurseries, and obstetric units at risk to acquire F infection due to asymptomatic delivery in mothers. Next slide. In these next two slides, uh, we, are, uh, we can see the report of uh, the uh, described neonatal cases of COVID-19 so far. The case series come, come mainly from China, from Italy, and from Spain. But as a matter of fact, uh, you see that uh, when we take a look at uh, the column respiratory support and the column neonatal illness, we can see mostly that there was no need for respiratory support, neither any manifestation of neonatal disease. And this is very reassuring because uh, probably when a mother is positive, the odds of uh, giving life to a affected infant is really low. Next slide. In this other one, we see in contrast a list of the babies described in literature as affected by COVID-19 with their outcomes. The, as you see in the right columns, symptoms and outcomes were mainly mild to moderate very few of them had a severe course, uh, there was no mortality. And please note also that uh, out of this list, uh, almost 90% uh, or even more were actually infants being older than one month of age. So technically there were no more neonates. Uh, the number of true neonates affected by COVID-19 and being diagnosed by COVID-19 is even lower than what reported here. Please, next slide. In fact, we could retrieve up to date only eight COVID positive neonates featuring a disease attributable to COVID and they came from China, from Italy, and one from Spain. Infected neonates were mostly asymptomatic, and as a matter of fact, the acquisition virus in these infants was likely horizontal from the mother, provided that no vertical transmission in these eight positive neonates had been demonstrated. Next slide. Which symptoms and signs? I tell you already that the majority of infants 
I would dare to say the totality of infants have only mild to moderate symptoms. So when do we need to suspect? Of course, we need to suspect a infected newborn if the baby is born from a, is born to a affected mother or a positive mother, and if there is an epidemiological correlation between this infant and a positivity in the family. However, if we take a look to symptoms and signs, we have no guidance because so far no single specific pattern of neonatal disease has been described and attributed to COVID. In other terms, there is no specificity of the symptomatology for COVID-19 in neonatal period. And therefore, the diagnosis cannot be clinical. I would uh, say, and this is, uh, please uh, go to next slide, that uh, uh, neonates might show lymphocytopenia or typical chest imaging findings. However, we as neonatologists know very well that lymphocyte and neutrophil count may be very much biased in neonatal period and that imaging for chest X-ray is not a very reliable tool to diagnose a specific pathogen as a cause of a neonatal distress or a respiratory disorder. Next slide. When we go to the specific guidance for neonatal management in the nursery and for breastfeeding, we saw in the first weeks of the epidemics a rising concern related to possible separation of the mother from the neonate um, in both in delivery room and specifically in ruminin and in the NICU. However, as the weeks went by and as the awareness of the limited severity of neonatal COVID was getting stronger, many scientific societies took a position uh, very consistent in recommending not separating mother and infant unless specific severe situations can occur. As you see in this list, uh, Apart from the Chinese society recommending separation from mother and infants and recommending avoiding to breastfeed, all other societies in the world, and I name here the AAP, the Italian Society, the European Union of the Neonatal Perinatal Societies, the French and the Brazilian, the UK societies, all of them recommend not to separate mother and neonate unless very limited situations occur, as I was telling you. And these situations, please next slides, occur when the mother is such a severely sick that she cannot attend her baby. In other words, what we care when uh, assessing the opportunity not to separate the mother and infant are mainly the conditions of the mother and not the condition of the neonate, provided that the neonate is stable, of course. So mothers who are severely sick uh, and cannot actually attend their baby, breastfeed their baby, and or sleeping in the same room with their baby can be recommended, can be considered for separation and need to be considered for use of expressed human milk. Otherwise, all other situations are eligible for a consistent recommendation. Do not separate mother and infant. Keep the infant in the same room 
with the mother, uh, enhance and endorse um, stimulation of the baby by the mother and uh, proximity of the baby to the mother with all barriers that can be taken in place, including masks, including hand washing, including uh, uh, hydroalcoholic solution to disinfect. But do not separate mother and infant. Keep, the, keep both of them in the same room, even though at a safety distance, and allow the baby to be breastfed by the mother. Breastfeeding is of uh, incredible importance here because uh, as just as I was showing you in the first part of my talk, breastfeeding is enabling babies to receive uh, those antibodies that uh, likely the mother is being developing against the coronavirus. So it's the only way in absence of uh, drugs to allow the baby to be treated in some way. Use of expressed milk is recommended only once more when the mother is such sick that cannot breastfeed. Please, the next slide. And what about the skin-to-skin -skin contact after delivery when the mother is COVID positive? Um, we, uh, with the Dr. Riccardo D'Avanzo, uh, we wrote a letter to the editor very recently uh, highlighting that there is no consistent official policy issued yet by academic societies. Uh, there are societies who support or contraindicate skin-to-skin -skin contact, other that simply omit mentioning skin-to-skin -skin contacts. However, if we, if we consider that COVID is not yet be detected neither in amniotic fluid nor in vaginal fluid, uh, it would be highly unlikely that COVID could be detectable on the maternal skin once the skin has been properly and appropriately disinfected. In addition, if we allow babies to be breastfed, why should we not allow babies to be taken at the breast with the skin skin to contact the the risk would be the same and therefore there is uh, absolutely no room for discarding or prohibiting skin to skin contact not only we all know that uh, skin to skin contact may promote a good microbiota and it's impacting on the production of uh, human fresh milk something that we absolutely uh, take advantage from. So our advice is not to interfere with skin-to-skin -skin contact unless mothers who are positive for COVID-19 are such sick that uh, it's not advisable to keep them in such situation after delivery. And the same applies, of course, to the neonate. Please, next slide. In summary, uh, what we recommend is that, uh, and what we actually have done in Italy, is that every single NICU develop a list of uh, priorities, a kind of a checklist, like the one that uh, I'm showing here, issued by the Padua uh, Neonatal Academic Center, um, highlighting which are all the uh, points and the needs to be taking into account when uh, thinking to prevention of COVID during this pandemic. There, there need to be actions uh, addressed towards the mother, towards the newborn, towards the healthcare providers, towards the parents, and all these actions need to be harmonized with consistent and fully shared protocols. Next slide. And my final point is uh, uh, to show you the, uh, the summary of the data from a survey conducted through uh, 32 neonatologists based in Italy, assessing, and this is a, a different point of view, the impact of COVID-19 on Italian neonatologists and not on Italian neonates. 
um, of course, this epidemic disrupted uh, severely our activities, our organization, our priorities. And as a matter of fact, uh, most of neonatologists uh, reported that uh, uh, in uh, 90% of cases, consultations with outpatients uh, were canceled or deferred, uh, if not urgent, many day hospital procedures were actually cancelled. It's concerning that 79% of neonatologists reported the fear, the perceived shortage of uh, protection health materials, and also 60% of them reported to be to have been working overtime above usual. Um, also, take into account, and this is uh, something that we shared with many other countries, that the 40 to 50 percent of neonatologists reported to have been uh, either included in service, in clinical service uh, in COVID-19 adult settings, or to have been taken nurses or doctors to help other units and wards where COVID-19 patients were admitted. So these epidemics touched very heavily all the pediatric and the neonatology community, even though neonates and children were poorly affected so far, what we had, what we went through is uh, absolutely impacting. Next slide. And my final uh, remind for you, and this is something that uh, Dr. Santana will uh, uh, develop in his talk uh, in a much more detailed way, take into account that uh, due to aerosol uh, transmission of uh, COVID-19, social distancing and hygiene in all settings, including neonatal units, uh, is absolutely compulsory. But remember that there is a room also for fecal oral transmission in uh, children and neonates. And this uh, raises the concern about uh, having precautions with diapers and with stools management in neonates attended in a neonatal ward. My key takeaways are listed here. Next slide, please. This epidemic is a true challenge we need to know as neonatologists that pregnant mothers may be affected, but usually with limited severity, and they can be in vast majority asymptomatic and, and going poorly diagnosed in our nursery. Even though no vertical transmission has been demonstrated to date, neonates that occasionally get sick from COVID-19 are few, but they are reported and they can experience very mild forms of the disease. Please keep in mind that no specific treatment nor vaccine exists today, to date and probably in the future. Thus, neonates and infants are the unique patients so far having the opportunity to receive the only possible treatment for this disease, that is maternal antibodies. Therefore, please do endorse and support breastfeeding as far as we don't have any specific tool to tackle this virus. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm now very happy to leave the floor to Professor Guillermo Santana from the McGill University Center of Montreal in Canada. Guillermo Santana is a, a, an expert in neonatal resuscitation and mechanical ventilation. And he developed very interesting skills in management of uh, risk patients and risk 
situations in the delivery room. So his talk will, will, be, will be terrific and very informative. Thanks, Guillermo, for joining us. Please, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Paolo, and thank you, Professor uh, Princini, uh, for your great presentation. And thank you for the invitation here. Um, let me try to share my, my screen with you. Okay, I hope you can see that. Um, it's okay. Um, it's, it was, um, we're going through a very interesting uh, time, you know. We've been challenged to, to know about a disease and make recommendations on the go. Uh, as the numbers are just going up. But I would say that I agree with both speakers that in neonatology and pediatrics, we've been very lucky that uh, we've been allowed time to understand better and develop these uh, guidelines uh, because the kids doesn't seem to be as much affected as adults. I have no financial relationship to disclose. I have no conflict of interest to resolve in everything I'll be presenting here. I want to say I'm not an infectious disease specialist at the, as the uh, previous speakers, and I'm not a virologist. I'm a neonatologist with a um, major interest in respiratory care. And because of that, when the WHO declared the pandemic in March 13th, I was uh, asked by the unit director to, oh, we need to come, uh, come up with guidelines and protocols for respiratory care of these babies. And, uh, and immediately, uh, no, I, I had no, no other way around. I had to accept it and do it. Uh, and then, okay, so what, what I'm going to do, I have to uh, learn about it. I have to study about that. Uh, and that's why we initiated this big journey of trying to understand uh, respiratory viruses in neonatology and uh, what should we do. Well, the first one, uh, which was not so difficult, was the management in the delivery room and the transport of the baby to the NICU. Um, why? Because, you know, as soon as we got um, deep into the literature, we came to realize that like, likelihood of vertical transmission, if, if the vertical transmit, transmission exists, is very rare. Um, so far, I'm not aware about any good case report that it, it does prove vertical transmission of coronavirus to uh, so resuscitation should be performed according to NRP, to all the guidelines. Sorry, Professor Santana. Sorry, Professor Santana. Your microphone, put the microphone a little bit far away from your um, shirt because it's uh, making noise. Okay, thank you. Is it better like that? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, just follow the recommendations of the societies and the resuscitation programs with slight modifications that I'll get back to you about that. And uh, the other recommendation is to minimize the exposure of healthcare workers. So the least number of people in the resuscitation room, uh, and if you need some more people, um, if you think you might need more people, just ask them to stay outside of the room waiting uh, to be called and follow the initial stabilization. Uh, and after that, the infant should be transferred to the neonatal intensive care unit inside the incubator and you, you should establish a pathway before. So this is the place we're gonna uh, go through. The problem is that the coronavirus is a respiratory virus and, uh, and respiratory virus can be transmitted by air droplets uh, and that droplets can contaminate surface as was explained here before. Uh, and then you need to be aware of that when you are applying uh, respiratory care for these patients because you're basically doing something uh, in the source of the virus, where exactly where the virus is. Uh, and to complicate it even more, um, it became more and more clear that not just droplets, but aerosol and fomite transmission uh, is plausible with uh, COVID-2, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then there have been a few studies that you can see here showing that it does remain viable and infectious in the aerosol for hours. But those studies were in adults, uh, while the adults were talking or sneezing or coughing. Um, 
and they were not about aerosol generating procedures. So the, then the second question that's open there, it was about aerosol generating medical procedures and viral transmission. We do a lot of those procedures in the NICU. Now, this is a cartoon to show you, for example, one of them, which is bag and mask ventilation. So during bag and mask ventilation, there have been um, a number of questions raised uh, in the development of those guidelines. Can the procedure generate aerosol? The answer is likely yes. How much aerosol is being generated? Can the aerosol generated during the procedure carry the virus RNA, um, have a big viral load, and therefore, can it travel long enough to the host? And for how long can it be in the air? And if get to the host, can it create the disease? So all these questions, and uh, we try to go in and find an answer for those questions. I will share with you some of the answers we're able to retrieve from the scientific literature, but I have to, to say that we are kind of um, very much surprised by the lack of good evidence, uh, even in the adult literature about that. So can the procedure generate aerosols and how much? Well, most of the respiratory procedures, that's the good news, are poor aerosol generators. Uh, as the particles remain large when you do that, and therefore they drop quickly in a short distance. And this was done by, um, it's a review published, whoever is interested in Journal of Hospital Infection uh, from CITO in Hong Kong, China. It's a pretty interesting one, talk about the facts and the myths about airborne transmission. We don't know how much aerosol and how much virus are produced. Uh, why? Well, because there's a heterogeneity between subjects uh, on the size, distribution, and quantity of the aerosol that are generated with a spontaneous coughing or sneezing or normal breathing. And basically, there's very little information on aerosol generating procedures. And also, patients have different viral loads. So when you apply, an AGP in a neonate, you basically don't know how much aerosol you're generating and you don't know how much virus, uh, virus is there in the, in the aerosol particles. This is an example for you uh, how to show how variable it can be. The study was published in American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine a few years ago. It was not with the coronavirus, with, was with RSV. Uh, and showing that the RSV could spread by aerosol, and they checked on children uh, on the wards, on the PICU. Uh, and as you can see here, for example, that I highlighted on the, in red, those are three, uh, two babies, three weeks old, one five kilos and the other one three kilos. And the amount uh, of a viral load in many different sizes particles generated is very, very variable. The baby here, for example, has minimal amount uh, of virus and many, uh, most of the particles are very, very small. Whereas here you can have particles that four more than seven millimeters or particles that are very, very small uh, with virus on that. So it's very unpredictable unless you measure that. And the same paper they measured, they did the same measurements in four babies, neonates in the uh, PICU and again, it can go from less than 0 0.1 to 183 uh, um, PFU uh, in, the, in, in different particle sizes. So it's very unpredictable. So, um, so can the procedure generate aerosol how much? So we talk about that. So the question now is can that aerosol um, float and then go into uh, different distances and for how long? There's increasing evidence showing that um, it can be transmitted at least over short distance. And, and if you're very close to the patient, you can get both. You can get the droplets and the aerosol, and that increases the chances of the healthcare worker to get contaminated. But in most settings where there's adequate ventilation, long range transmission uh, of aerosol from uh, viral, those viral infections is very unlikely. So can it transmit the disease? Well, usually um, the infectivity of aerosol is a hundred times less than the infectivity of droplets. 
And there's many, many people that have been trying to measure that and including uh, the use of mathematical modeling to try to kind of uh, uh, come up with a probability that you'll be infected uh, during those situations. So this is an example for you, whoever is interested on that. Um, they use the Markov chain model. They combine all different modes of transmission, several parameters and the specific pathogens on that. And for example, if a healthcare worker stays 15 minutes at the bedside, uh, in an adult patient that was not coughing or sneezing, the probability of infection by aerosol in that room is very, very low. It's eight to the uh, times 10 minus six. Uh, if the healthcare worker stays 15 minutes at the bedside and the patient is coughing, uh, with the healthcare worker in the room, um, the probability to be infected by large droplets is 0.14. Um, but if, he, if the healthcare worker is entering the room at any time, a patient that was coughing, the probability of infection by aerosol, it's again, very, very low. So these are mathematical models that try to take into account everything that happened. Uh, so it's a very difficult um, answer to get how much the aerosol can transmit in a viral infection. It's not, it's not like a tuberculosis who is an airborne disease. Um, show, to, to, to kind of support that the transmission by aerosol, it's small. Uh, we just go back to the uh, results of the RISPEC trial that was published last year in JAMA. Uh, showing that the use of surgical masks, medical surgical masks, were as efficient as N95 in protect healthcare workers. And they, they included very, several viruses in that study um, and some species of coronavirus. So we know that surgical masks are not the ideal, uh, is not the ideal protection against aerosol. So it seems that you know, if, if the aerosol does exist, it's more likely it does not transmit the disease. I was kind of surprised because this is the systematic review of aerosol generating procedures and risk of transmission. Uh, the one that was used by WHO to make the recommendations. And when you look at the quality and the, uh, and the studies that were included, any conclusions uh, drawn from the systematic review should be uh, interpreted with caution. Very small number and very low quality of the studies. So the level of evidence was considered very low at that time. Uh, and based on the grade, it does suggest that some procedures can potentially generate aerosol and can potentially play a, play a role, but again, it's not proved. So we had to come up with guidelines for uh, respiratory care on neonatal, in the, in the in neonates during the COVID situation. It's difficult because, you know, first of all, we don't really know what is, um, there's no specific, uh, 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 a specific picture to, to make the diagnosis of SARS in neonate. So the true picture, as Dr. Manzoni said, it's yet unknown. So we don't know uh, what is a ARGS in neonate uh, related to the COVID infection. Uh, I think, you know, um, uh, the places that I have seen more cases of neonatal uh, infection um, should perhaps think about using this classification, the Montreux definition of neonatal ARGS, because you know neonates have so many diseases such as respiratory distress syndrome, TTN, meconium aspiration, and other ones that uh, it would be important to try to differentiate. This is ARGS likely related to the virus or not other common disease we see in neonatology. And then those questions created a lot of stress and there are many things like PPE to be used in isolation precautions. Uh, they worry some about AGPs, airway placement precautions, and we're gonna go over them in the next slides. We came up with a, a table of practical approach and I'll walk you through this uh, table in the next uh, slides. For manual ventilation, the risk of viral transmission with manual ventilation based on the systematic review was evaluated only in a few studies. And it was not independently associated with increased risk of viral transmission. In reality, the chances of you acquire a viral transmission were three times higher with endotracheal intubation than with baggy mask ventilation. Um, and when we look into um, some studies that were experimental studies of air dynamics in mannequins done in Hong Kong, 
They use an adult simulator to make, mimic varying, varying uh, severity of lung injury. And of course, it's an adult uh, mannequin, so the volume is pretty high, 300 to, four, to 350 ml. And they measure the air dispersion with that. And it was around 0.3 to 0.35 meters while you were doing the bagging. We did another experiment using non-invasive ventilation and a five-fold decrease on the tidal volume was associated with 30% reduction in air dispersion, showing there was some correlation, the less volume of the air, of air you push when you're doing the bagging, the less uh, air dispersion you get, which makes sense. So if you think about, and this is the experiment they have done, and you can see here, you know, this is the operator doing the bagging in the mannequin, uh, and, the, and then there is a laser light here that highlights the smoke, which is the air dispersion. And then they use temperature um, and they use many different fancy ways to quantify the different concentration, which is the color here. Uh, and you could see that the dispersion of the air was around 0.3 to 0.35 meters away from the mask of the patient in adults. But you know, there's no AGP and air dispersion study in neonates. There's basically nothing published there. Uh, and we know the neonates that we bag and mask, we use tidal volumes that are 15, 16 to 20 times lower than the tidal volumes they use in the adult mannequin. So this is, a, we saw in the adult mannequin a nonlinear relationship, but we, seduce, we did some calculations. And instead of 300, 350 cc, if you use 15 to 18 cc in the neonatal model, the air dispersion will be about two centimeters. So not much away from the mask of the baby. And that's what we came up with this figure in the paper showing that, you know, the air dispersion in a baby, it's much less than in an adult. Even if you have a leak around the mask and in, through the exhalation valve, it's basically because you're generating a much smaller tidal volume. Uh, nevertheless, technical skills are very important because, you know, if you put somebody there to do the bagging that doesn't know well to do that, you can have more uh, leak and, of course, more air dispersion. Uh, so in neonatal respiratory care, uh, avoid manual ventilation just because you don't want, you want to prevent air dispersion appears unnecessary. Uh, and then when in, the, in our protocol, we, we did say, don't do that. Because there was some talk at the beginning of the epidemic, oh, we should intubate this baby right away. We should not be bagging this baby. And it does not make any sense for us. But we need data. We need more data because we basically have no data in neonates. It's just speculation. So we're very lucky that we had the Department of Medical, Industrial, and Aerospace Engineering at Concordia University in, in Montreal. And I... I, I just got in contact with those folks here and they, they are engineers, they were home. The university was under lockdown, the labs were closed and I wrote to them and they got very interested. I said, we need to look into that. We need to know how much air dispersion we create when we bag a neonatal mannequin. Uh, do you guys have the material or the equipment to do that? Would you be willing to do that? They got very excited and uh, I ended up writing a letter to the university uh, asking for authorization to open the lab and just we could do some uh, some experiments to uh, to evaluate if the hypothesis that the dispersion is much less than in adults was true or not. So this is a preliminary data. The first video we generated, it's not yet published and we're basically using that to see if the, 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 the hypothesis was true or not. As you can see here, this is a piston and basically it's gonna press the bag uh, and this is a neonatal mannequin around four kilos. And the mask is here completely sealed. And you see that there's a valve of the, of, the, uh, of the bag here. And basically in this bag, it's a self-inflating bag. In that kind of bag, it's a one-way valve. So the air goes into the mask and it comes out through here. So the arrows here, which is the exhalation holes you have into the system is a one-way valve. So as the laser jet, the laser sheet comes here uh, on this angle here and the camera was around here. So as you're gonna see as I play the video's 11 second video, the piston pushes the bag and the chest of the baby moves. 
and there is some generation of air here, air dispersion here. Then the move, uh, the movie changes to the to the camera, and you will see that there is some smoke. We use a very we use two different sizes of particles. One was smoke, which is less than one micron, and the other one was a ten micron particle. And you can see that there is some dispersion of the smoke, but I'll show you. Uh, and just keep in mind that when it changes to the camera, uh, the camera is zoomed very close to the valve. So you see it's bagging and the chest is moving. So uh, I just stopped the movie here. There is some dispersion with the small particle, but that dispersion is very close to the exhalation valve here. The concentration is very close. So this is a, a maximized, a zoomed video. And the distance, the distance between the valve and here is about three centimeters. So there's a very small dispersion. And if you use large particles, with the size of 10 microns, there's basically no dispersion, so I'll play to you. So, um, nevertheless, um, we still have to do a lot of uh, experiments to show that, because you know, this was a unidimensional view. So we're moving into a tri-dimensional way to capture the air dispersion. But it was very promising to show that new knowledge cannot be just importing the data that comes from adults. We, we deal with a different population, different lung disease, different devices, and much smaller tidal volume. So the likelihood of a major air dispersion during the AGPs in new is much, much less. In the meantime, we need to follow the recommendations that are out there. And one of them is to use filters. Uh, you need to use filters that are during your bagging. And so just show you that basically two type, two different types of filters, the heated and moisture exchanging filter is not j just the HME. The HME is not a filter, it's just a humidifier and a heater. So it is the HMEF. Uh, and you have the hydro hydrophobic filter, which is the HEPA. And that is, this is just some examples of them. There are many different manufacturers. Uh, the smaller is the baby, the smaller should be the filter. Otherwise, it'd be edging, depending on where you put the filter, it might be adding a lot of uh, ed, uh, dead space to the system. So this uh, uh, drawing was given to me uh, as a courtesy by the NRP uh, program in Brazil, the Brazilian Society of Pediatrics. And it's basically to show where you should place your filter. It's a bit too big here, you should use smaller filter. Ideally, if you have a, a bag, that has a PIP valve, it should be in the exhaling, exhalation uh, system. Uh, but if you don't, uh, you put it between the bag and the mask. Just keep in mind when you do that here, you'll be ventilating the filter. So there's an additional dead space. Uh, if you use the Neopath or the cheap piece ventilator, it's the same. There's no way you can put in the exhaling piece. So you have to put in between uh, your, your, your peep valve here and the, and the mask. Uh, and if you put the baby on CPAP with the Neopuff of the ventilator, it's pretty much the same. However, if you put the baby on bubble CPAP, that's what we do in the delivery room here. Uh, just put the filter, uh, and in the NICU also, just put the filter before uh, the exhaling part of the system uh, gets into the water. What about suction? Suction is, a, is thought to be you know, another AGP. Uh, in the systematic review, suctioning and collection of sputum was not associated with the increased risk of uh, viral uh, transmission. Uh, there's some evidence in non-intubated patients that if you do continuous suction during any procedure, you have less uh, aerosol dispersion. Non-invasive support was a big debate. Um, a lot of places at the beginning, at the very beginning, the first uh, two weeks are saying that, no, we cannot provide CPAP, we cannot do any nasal ventilation, have to intubate the baby right away. For us, it, this was a big uh, issue because we know how much mechanical ventilation affects the lungs of those kids. And we're kind of fighting for years and years, like Paolo was saying, fighting for breastfeeding and suddenly you don't do breastfeeding without any strong evidence. That was the same for non-invasive support. 
So uh, we know CPAP and IPPV are very important uh, to take care of babies, even babies with viral pneumonia or early ARGS. Uh, and there is a possibility that uh, non-invasive support can make droplets into an aerosol, uh, and that may disperse. Uh, however, in the previous outbreaks, there was no, um, no study that showed that um, the use of non-invasive support was associated with the increased risk of infection in healthcare professionals. Uh, and most of the time, during NIPPV, the, the droplets, uh, this is a procedure that generates big particles, more than 10 microns and not a lot of aerosol. Like I said in the beginning, most of these procedures are poor aerosol generators. Uh, the same uh, group in Hong Kong did um, an experiment in adult mannequins on NIMV, and the maximum was 0 0.87 meters of dispersion. And again, it's a very large volume that they use in adults. So you, you again, think about in neonate with a extremely smaller volume, your dispersion on NIPPV or CPAP should be much, much less. So basically our recommendation is that NIPPV and CPAP uh, appear to be safe. Of course, uh, if we don't, uh, as we don't have very, very strong data now, there's a lot of high speculations and hypotheses, you should do that in adequate ventilator room with proper protection, careful fitting of the interface, and put, as I said, the hydrophobic filter there. Uh, when you put the hydrophobic filter in the um, expiratory uh, phase of the system, keep in mind that it might increase resistance. Uh, however, you know, I've done some measurements recently and the increase in resistance is, is very, very, very small. For high flow nasal cannula, I know a lot of places use high flow nasal cannula uh, routinely in their NICU, we don't. Um, but you know, again, there's very limited data from adults uh, as you increase the flow because uh, high flow nasal cannula, you have to have a large leak. So there's a higher chance that by doing that, you, you'll be spreading more of the virus. There's no data in neonates. And once again, extrapolating uh, to neonates, the numbers from adults would seem that the, high, uh, the air dispersion of high flow will also be low. The main problem is endotracheal intubation. Uh, in all the outbreaks, endotracheal intubation was the greatest uh, risk procedure for viral transmission because you know you put your face very close uh, to the face of the patient. Uh, and there's an influenza study that confirmed, confirmed that the endotracheal intubation and bronchoscopy were the only significant AGPs associated with viral transmission. Um, for neonates, uh, there's no information on viral transmission with intubation. It's basically not available. There's no data about surfactant administration in neonates and viral transmission, uh, especially, you know, either if you give a surfactant via endotracheal tube or if you use not less invasive techniques also, uh, there is no uh, data on that. Uh, but given the potential risk of transmission, if you're going to do that in a suspected or confirmed neonatal case, it should be fully protected. Uh, the other issue that people talked a lot, it was the size of the endotracheal tube. You, you should be using the size you're used to do. Don't try to put a bigger size and then have a subglot stenosis or tracheal lesion. Uh, even if the tubes are uncuffed, uh, a leak of 10, 20% in a very small volume that you're ventilating babies is very unlikely. This is gonna increase the air dispersion and increase the chances of infection. Uh, babies that need mechanical ventilation should be uh, placed on mechanical ventilation and everybody taking care of these babies should be under uh, protective measures. The filter should be placed into the expiratory system uh, and ideally, you should use all the time a closed endotracheal suction, uh, simply to avoid when you do this, the aspiration to spread the virus. There's no clear data on uh, to support any specific mode. It can be any specific mode of ventilation, including high frequency ventilation. Uh, the only thing you have to keep in mind is that for this, if you use sensomatics, the sensomatics um, you can place a, a filter, but um, the way to place the filter in the sense of have to replace the whole system. And whereas the other one, you can just interplace 
a filter in the expiratory phase and the sensomerics have to change the whole circuit. Thank you and uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward for the questions. Thank you very much, Paolo. It's very important to see the opinion of an expert regarding all these uh, strategies that need to be implemented when, uh, when facing these uh, very disrupting epidemics. So we are running through the time, but I think that if uh, the provider doesn't matter, we can start having a discussion and uh, those who are connecting and feel like continuing being connected and uh, listening to the question and answer debate uh, are more than welcome. Uh, we received a, a huge number of questions. I tried to break down them for speaker and for areas. So if uh, um, Professor Principi is connected, I will start with him because there are a number of questions regarding the area of pediatric COVID and which can be the, um, the relationships and example with the previous vaccinations, which can be the relationships with uh, orofecal contamination. So Professor Principi, are you there? Yeah, I am here. Okay. Okay, excellent. Ready for your question. Yes. So, okay, the it, problem is so if you are available, uh, I, I can uh, propose you a couple of questions that were addressed to you. The first one is uh, your opinion about uh, the low proportion of affected children. Could it be simply an artifact because uh, tests uh, are run uh, very uh, rarely and uh, there is a limiting testing uh, for cases that are not symptomatic? It, it is highly likely that the official number of uh, incidents of COVID-19 in children uh, under-evaluate the real, uh, the real incidence rate, mainly because uh, children are asymptomatic in a great number of cases or have a mild disease that uh, is, is not attractive for uh, the parents, uh, for uh, the family pediatrician. And so they are not uh, calculated in the total number of children with uh, COVID-19. Uh, th th this is a, a consequence uh, of uh, the fact that uh, most of the children have a mind disease or are asymptomatic. Yeah, oh, correct. I agree. Um, in another, another very intriguing question regarding uh, BCG, the vaccination for tuberculosis, uh, an attendant is asking whether uh, we could expect differences in the response to COVID in the BCG vaccinated infants and compared with those who are naive. It's possible that uh, there, are, uh, there are differences uh, in uh, the clinical manifestation or the incidence uh, rate of infection derived from uh, other clinical situation. We have no data regarding uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it is difficult to, to derive a definite conclusion from uh, other, other type uh, of infections. And uh, a final question, at least for this first round. Uh, your expert opinion regarding use of drugs for treatment of pediatric COVID patients. Which children are eligible, in your opinion, to receive drugs? I have shown a slide in which a list of children were reported as candidates for treatment. In that slide, only children with underlying the their chronic disease were, uh, were listed. And this is a recommendation of the US uh, uh, CDC. 
I think that uh, also severe cases uh, in otherwise healthy children could be considered a possible uh, subjects for uh, treatment. But we have uh, to remember that we do not know how children can uh, respond to the different drugs. We have no data. And this is uh, a very important problem because uh, the uh, of uh, drugs in children drug that has been authorized for using children is remdesivir. And this is uh, an authorization that was uh, made uh, in the USA, not in other countries. And you have to remember that the authorization is based uh, on only one paper Uh, in which it was uh, the medicine was effective not uh, on the number of deaths but on the duration uh, of the disease and uh, there are uh, several doubts uh, on the real efficacy of these drugs uh, and we have no data on uh, the safety and tolerability in children. Paolo is disappeared. We have missed Paolo. Uh, yes, he's probably uh, reconnecting to the to the meeting. Okay, so uh, Professor Principi and Professor Santana, if you see on the question and answer button, there's uh, uh, many questions which arrived for both of you. So if you can have a look and maybe continue with the discussion while Professor Manzoni is reconnecting. I have a question for uh, uh, Santana. What is your opinion uh, on the best distance to avoid the risk uh, of infection between two children? Um. The, the, my micro no, can you hear me? Yeah. The, in the, the, what is your opinion about uh, the best distance between children to avoid the risk of transmission of infection when they play? <laughs> yeah, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. It's uh, um, I'm not. I could not find um, good measurements of uh, air dispersion and transmission in children. There's not many studies on that, you know. I, one was the one in uh, RSV. Uh, the other one was, uh, there was one in influenza virus. There's basically none in coronavirus. But if you think that they are similar and should be the same, um, you know, the one in the uh, RSV, in some children in the wards, uh, over time, uh, it basically the virus was, was detected far away, three, four meters, over time. But if you're close, like for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, uh, if you are one meter or two meters for a short period of time, it's very, very unlikely you, you're going to get it. But if you are in, on the wards uh, in, in the bed and coughing and sick and there for days, there are other ones there because, you know, the studies they have done, there are six different children uh, in six different beds. Uh, and then they put a uh, uh, impactor outside three meters, and then they collected the virus load, you know, outside the PFU outside. Uh, so, but then you you have six children that are uh, theoretically spreading the virus over time, and then you can have it. So it's more for healthcare workers in into hospitals that this is a major concern than kids playing close to the other one, I think, you know, my hypothesis is not going to be very, very big. Uh, the problem with children, that, as you said very well, uh, is that they are asymptomatic carrier, carriers uh, and adults get very close to them uh, for some, especially the smaller ones, for longer time. Uh, and then there's a big chance that they can just spread it to adults and then create the chain of infection spreading. One of the problem is whether or not all 
the asymptomatic children can shed the virus. And what is the amount of virus that is shed? This is a big problem. We, we do not know. Uh, we do not know um, in adults. We have to measure it. Uh, and then I was surprised. Um, you, you're an infectologist, but I'm not. I was surprised when I was reading to see that there's not really a, a linear relationship between viral load and how sick you are. You know, it's, it's more likely that when you are very sick that you have a higher viral load, but this relationship is not so clear. Can you see? I think you can see me and can you, you can hear me. So thank you for following up uh, during my absence. Uh, these uh, technical issues uh, are still difficult to manage. Um, I, I take the opportunity to go further with this uh, issue of uh, viral load because uh, in, uh, I'm, very, I'm very aware about uh, a similar model of viral load that is RSV and RSV, uh, there is a clear relationship between viral load and severity of the disease, not only with severity, but also with the late outcomes. So, so in my opinion, it would be absolutely unlikely that the viral load does not count in determining severity, provided that we are dealing with the respiratory viruses, uh, that we are dealing with uh, um, viruses uh, belonging to families uh, uh, that uh, have similar models uh, in patients. Um, one, uh, I don't know if you took this questions, question already during my absence, but uh, there was a, a, a question for you, Guillerme. Um, the risk of dispersion when using oxygen hoods. Uh, can you comment on that? Um, so just to clarify, I, I was talking about viral load um, dispersion into the aerosols. So uh, I was not able, you know, in that study with RSV, some kids that are very asymptomatic, had a huge viral load detected in the aerosols. Uh, and some that are very symptomatic had a smaller uh, viral load. So uh, I'm not, I was not referring to the viral load on the patient, but basically how much viral load they spread. Um, so yeah. um, for the, for the, um, for the oxyhood, um, no, we did not look into that. And no, I, I was not able to find anything, um, but Perhaps, you know, uh, because uh, you're putting a plexiglass around the face of the baby, perhaps mm -hmm. you have less dispersion. Uh, however, you, when you put that plexiglass, you have to flow through that. Uh, and uh, depending on how much flow you put to wash the oxyhood, you may be dispersing more. So I don't think there's any data um, there. I mean, no, I, I used to make a joke and I want to um, know your opinion about that. I'm more worried in the neonatal intensive care unit of the big term baby crying asymptomatic yeah. than the preemies on the respiratory care. Sure. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, it's absolutely correct. Well, I... I take a couple of questions because, and this is something that can be discussed by the whole faculty here. There are a number of questions, probably the most numerous uh, item, um, alluding to the fact that uh, under this epidemic, uh, we should expect uh, uh, modifications in the epidemics of other respiratory viruses in the next months, uh, for example, in the next uh, winter season in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, similar to what happened with uh, the H1N1 epidemics, uh, at that time there was a reduction in uh, influenza, a reduction in RSV bronchiolitis uh, due to the stringent uh, hygiene measures. So uh, this is something that can be envisaged. At the same time, many attendants are asking whether the ongoing epidemic is prompting us to reinforce strategies for immunization of neonates and preterm neonates even beyond what we are routinely doing. So um, 
Guillerme, once more, which is your opinion? Then I will tell you mine, and then we can ask a professor principal. So my, my, I'm not an infectologist, so you guys are the expert on that. Um, we have noticed here uh, much less cases of bronchiolitis uh, in the hospital. So I don't know if this is the isolation or not going to school or not, not willing to come to the hospital because you know there is a COVID mm -hmm. situation going, and then you take care of your baby home. But we had much less, you know, the, in, as a matter of fact, the ER in Montreal, which is the biggest pediatric ER in North America, the number of patients that they see, uh, people were doing nothing. They were like waiting for patients. They were basically with no patients in the ER <laughs> yeah. for weeks. Yes, yes. So this, this is happening in Italy as well. Uh, we just sent out a preliminary report uh, from our unit and uh, some other units in Italy uh, which collected the data and we were able to show similar findings with uh, an abrupt decrease in number of visits. But uh, uh, Professor Principi, are you still there? Can you still uh, answer questions? Um, if you are there, I, okay. I place this question again to you. With, uh, will uh, this epidemic uh, advice pediatricians and neonatologists to reinforce vaccination and immunization strategies. Let's think uh, as an example to influence uh, vaccination in preterm infants and uh, young infants is something that uh, at least in Italy is not ever done. Italy is a particular country regarding influenza vaccination in children because uh, there are a lot uh, of the pediatricians that agree with the, idea, with the idea to vaccinate the children against influenza, but uh, health authorities uh, do not agree. And uh, <laughs> vaccine uh, is uh, not recommended. Uh, it is not clear why, but uh, it is so. But uh, I think that uh, there are uh, several, uh, um, uh, several experts uh, that suggest uh, the use of influenza vaccine in children. And I think that uh, the Present, uh, the present uh, pandemic uh, will reinforce the use of influenza vaccine to reduce uh, the risk of uh, infections uh, and also to permit uh, the identification of the true pandemic cases. Uh, Correct. Uh, in, this is uh, probably valid uh, for adults, that, that uh, old people uh, usually uh, do not uh, perform uh, influenza vaccine despite it is recommended. And the use of the vaccine uh, in the next uh, winter season can uh, also uh, have an effect uh, on uh, the prognosis of the two cases uh, of uh, COVID-19. It is important. In children, I think that uh, most of the, of the pediatrician, the family, pediatrician, uh, the primary care pediatrician will recommend the influenza vaccine uh, also to reduce the risk of new uh, diseases. Correct. I, I think this is a, a, a balanced position. Uh, I, this might be an opportunity for neonatologists and uh, pediatrician also to reconsider this uh, discrepancy as just as you were alluding. And the same may apply for RSV. A number of other questions are asking me specifically whether I advise reinforcing RSV prophylaxis with preterm neonates in the next epidemic season. I, I can't argue so far. As of today, we still don't have data. My presumption is that the um, reinforced hygiene measures and the attention against uh, contact uh, and uh, uh, contamination uh, will help anyhow in preventing and decreasing the burden of uh, many respiratory viruses, including RSV. But of course, uh, it's a matter of uh, debate whether this uh, ongoing epidemic might suggest to uh, reinforce prophylactic uh, strategies, uh, as an example with palivizumab. But this is something that is still open. You have to convince uh, the gynecologist seen a pregnant woman. This is 
current influenza, the, the right solution is to vaccine the mother before vaccine the child. This is a, this is a, the first month of life can be covered only by maternal vaccination. Exactly. This is another very interesting point. And uh, of course, uh, this is uh, uh, claiming and advocating once more for uh, synergistic uh, actions between uh, uh, all perinatologists, that is, uh, all obstetricians and all neonatologists, in order to have the same strategy. And uh, my final question for uh, Guillerme. Um, there are uh, there are a few questions, uh, Guillerme, asking again uh, your personal opinion on using respiratory support filter in the delivery room when mothers have a COVID status who that is unknown. So I think the the bulk of this question is to understand whether under this current epidemic, all equipment in delivery room should be managed cautiously with filters. Yeah, though this is you a great think? question. <laughs> this is a great question. Um, may I ask you uh, what are you guys doing? Uh, are you guys using the filter? No, we don't do it unless uh, the mother is uh, COVID-19 positive and known. But or su suspected also or suspected, okay. uh, yes. Yeah. But of course, this is a very poignant question because it's a matter of uh, organization and it's critical. Yeah. Well, I think this is a question that we don't know for sure the answer, but uh, uh, the practice here is um, if the mom is suspected or positive, we go um, to the delivery room with all protection. So we use the PPEs and, um, and we use the filter. Um, however, we've made a, um, we put into the paper, and you know that, um, that for babies less than a kilo, I find it quite challenging. Mm. Uh, we don't have small enough filters, uh, and uh, you do add a lot of dead space. And there were some concerns about inadvertently increasing the CO2 and have more bleeding into the brain, intracranial bleeding or IVH. Uh, in the resuscitation of these extremely preterm babies, when you know it's extremely unlikely they will be born shedding the virus. Um, the argument to use it uh, is, oh, you have not yet proved that there is no vertical transmission uh, and baby gets in contact with mom, blood, amniotic fluid, secretion, and et cetera on the way out. Uh, and therefore, it may be uh, may have the virus into the airway and you know when you suction the airway of the baby and you do have maternal blood there and secretion. Uh, you know it's true that maternal blood can have the virus but if I'm not wrong and Dr. No, Princiti, I don't know I can't say in, in Italian well Princiti, um, it's less than 10% of the patients that are positive, they have a viremia going on. So it's, again, it's very, very small percentage. Uh, and um, in the amniotic fluid, as far as I know, uh, there have been no case reports of positive PCR in the amniotic fluid. There have been a few case reports in the placenta surface. So therefore, it might be in the amniotic fluid. So, but anyway, these are very rare uh, situations. So. I think it's unlikely the baby is born and has the virus and can contaminate the healthcare professionals. Uh, but you know what we're doing here, because I had the experience to ventilate, bag and mask ventilator 600 gram with the filter uh, and it was quite challenging and I have a lot of experience on that. So we're kind of avoiding to put the filter if the baby is less than a kilo. Uh, it's an extreme preterm babies. And we are putting the filter in the bigger ones. Um, however, I have to say that, you know, this is a, a situation that in the middle of the pandemics, you don't have enough data. You just want to protect people in case. Uh, and that's why you do that. Uh, we need evidence. We need data because, uh, like you said very well, this is here to stay. They might have other waves and they might have other viral infections coming in the future. And we need to know because, you know, uh, my argument to the Concordia University people is that neonates are 
10 to 20% of the neonates end up in the intensive care unit and a lot of them end up submitted to a respiratory care and a lot of them to those procedures that may be generating. So we need to know, are we putting all this money, all these things in these babies when the chances are that these babies are gonna spread the virus in the air a minimal? Uh, so we need to have more data on, on that. Uh, as, a, as my final say, Paolo, I, we just talked a lot here in the unit, um, giving advice for people to not change very much the way they practice. We are very much worried about doing harm because of the panic uh, around the COVID situation and end up doing harm by changing the way you ventilate or changing the way you practice uh, respiratory support on those patients. We, I don't know your experience in Italy and Dr. Princini, uh, Princici in Italy, but we have tested many neonates in the NICU here, a very large number of them. Every single, we don't have a single positive case. Um, so uh, um, maybe we are overdoing it, uh, but without a final answer, we want to protect everybody. I see that Paolo is frozen. Doctor Principi, 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 is that right? Principi. I got it, Principi. Principi. Yes. Uh, do you have any comments about that? I don't hear your question. Do you have any comments about uh, all these measures in the delivery room? The use of filters and all the precautions in the delivery room. I am not a neonatologist. <laughs> I am it, uh, it's Paolo, the best neonatologist in Italy, but uh, it, he disappeared. Someone uh, Yes, we are trying to, to get in contact with, with uh, Professor Manzoni. <laughs> the problem is that uh, Paolo has the closer meeting. <laughs> he should close uh, the meeting. Uh, in other words, we, 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 we can close the meeting. We, we can thank uh, all uh, the participants. We can thank uh, Professor Santana. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, okay. I'm here again. So can you can you see me and can you hear me? Yes, yes Professor. Okay, thank you. So it's uh, it's my fault here. I touched something that I didn't uh, <laughs> that I couldn't touch, but Anyway, I think we we have come to the end now, uh, despite uh, having had a, a very, the, despite having the need not to answer all the questions that have been placed, uh, we recorded uh, more than 60 quest 50 questions. And uh, of course, there's no room for addressing each single one. But nonetheless, I'm very, very happy to, to have had the opportunity to, go, to, to, get, to drive this uh, webinar, to perform this activity together with uh, two experts. And uh, I want to remind all the attendants that uh, the recording of this uh, webinar will be available on the ICCN uh, conference website. So 
the next conference in Torino, Italy, will be performed in early September. Please visit, visit the website because information and updates will be available there, including the recording of this uh, webinar uh, series. So my pleasure to thank uh, all the speakers, uh, to thank the organization and to thank all the attendants for joining us today for this uh, two hours uh, update and educational event about uh, neonatal COVID. And please uh, keep uh, safe, keep healthy, keep enthusiastic of your job and stay tuned for the next updates for our conference. Thank you very much to everyone and uh, have a great day.